A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week focus on tragedies involving mothers and babies. Police say that a pregnant mother in Ohio was shot by her toddler who was playing with a gun. The pregnant woman survived long enough to call 911. The mother was rushed to the hospital. Her unborn baby delivered by emergency C-section. That baby didn't make it. And soon after, the mother passed away. Now what happens? There's a two-year-old boy who may be responsible for his mother's death and that of his sibling. What does justice look like in this case? But first... It's the most extraordinary criminal case I've ever seen. A hated mother in Australia who was called a baby killer and the country's worst female serial killer because her four babies under the age of two died suddenly and mysteriously. After the fourth baby died, prosecutors said there was no way that four babies in one home could die of crib death. And so this hated woman was sent to prison for murder. 20 years later, She's been pardoned and freed because scientists using new technology not available at the time of the trial figured out that the woman carried a defective gene which her babies inherited, a rare genetic mutation that doctors now say could have caused SIDS. We're recording this on Wednesday, June 28th of 2023. Our guest today is Susan Hendricks, a journalist, a news anchor, an author. Susan is writing a book on the Delphi murders of Abby and Libby, a case that Susan has discussed here on the podcast before. We are so excited that Susan is back with us. Welcome back, Susan. So good to see you, Anna. Great to be here. Uh, A lot of cases to discuss and very um, disheartening and sad overall. It really is. These are so tragic and... You know, I can't even say in the first case with the woman who lost her four babies that the fact that she's been pardoned, Susan, I don't think we can even say the words a happy ending because she's been freed and perhaps, you know, proven that that maybe she didn't kill them. Right. And her best friend, the resilience that she had for her friend saying for a short time in between, I mean, it's been 20 years, she was behind bars for that short time. She said, I felt guilty. I had a lot going on in my own life. We reconnected and she fought hard for the technology, as you said earlier, that wasn't available to become available for people to finally pay attention. It's an incredible case. I mean, what we're talking about here is a new piece of evidence that also provides a new twist in this case that no one could have possibly have known at the time because the science was not available. That is what is so incredible about this case. A judge in Australia now says that the mother dubbed the worst female serial killer in the country likely did not kill her four babies, but a newly discovered genetic mutation that she passed on to the babies could have caused crib death. This case is out of New South Wales, Australia. And and the issue here is reasonable doubt because at the time of her trial, I mean, Susan, how it's unheard of to have a home, a mother with four babies, four babies under the age of two who die suddenly and mysteriously. It's, it's, it's hard for any mother to comprehend that. And those not in the medical world or without access, as you said, um, to the gene testing or genealogy or what have you there that wasn't available. So, of course, if you're a juror and you're listening to this, not one, not two, not three, but four of her children, two boys, two girls dying and the husband coming in and handing over her journal that she was documenting, her diary, that she was writing down how she was feeling as a mom, that was admissible. And so the jurors looked at that, and of course it's circumstantial, but they sided on the side of the prosecution. Exactly, the journal, her diaries were very dark. It's it's easy for anyone to understand how depressed she was, how depressed the whole the whole family was, the, the the trauma that of losing so many so many babies children so when someone writes something that dark it's my fault in a diary you know you could look at it two ways sure it's your fault you're the mother it's your job to protect these babies but when you're looking at a criminal case and you write it's your fault right 
it all of a sudden you look at it quite differently, especially since at the time we were looking at, well, how is it possible that four babies could die in a row in their cribs? How, how is that possible? How does that happen? One of the lines that stood out to me, she was saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, I just wanted her to be quiet. And she finally was, meaning when she passed away. So was that I heard a psychologist say in a report that I watched that, look, this was her documenting depression. Now, did she have postpartum depression? Maybe we don't know. She was never diagnosed, but documenting depression instead of admitting to any wrongdoing. And and who would not be depressed? Mm -hmm. what woman, what woman would not be beside herself with grief, depression? I, it's a hole I could never climb myself out of. I, mm -hmm. I, I could not. And um, you and I were talking before we started the podcast and we were both saying like, Susan, I don't know if after losing one baby, I could try for, a, for another baby. But after two babies, I don't know if I could go for a third. And that I, I just, I couldn't, I'd be so frightened. I couldn't do it. And the defense didn't call at the time. It's easy to look back and say, well, they could have and should have done this, but they didn't call an expert, a psychiatrist, psychologist to the stand and saying, look, I read um, what's in her diary and this could be a symptom of this postpartum depression. And was she able to heal from the death of her first baby, her second, her third? as she went on to have four and how much did that play in? Of course, as you know, Anna, the husband heartbroken too. Well, he's reading through this, hands it over to the prosecution. He's heartbroken as well. So who knows? It tore the family apart no matter what. No responsibility for it, if you believe that, still losing four of her kids and her husband and vice versa. So she is pardoned and thanks to her best friend who was there when she got out of prison. Yeah, it is. It, it's it's a case like nothing I have ever seen. And have you seen anything like this? No, it's just so tragic to be in day in and day out. I was listening to a couple of the conversations she had with her best friend from behind bars. She tried to keep uh, the positivity going. I mean, 5, 10, 15, 20 years in, you think this is never happening for me. I'm not getting out. And then finally, a scientist, several of them were able to come forward and say, we discovered this and it could be the cause of the death. death. Yeah. It's extraordinary to, to, I don't know. I, I think as a mother, I, of course, you're so heartbroken. You can never be repaired after the loss, to, the loss of a child. But then if I, as a mother know, okay, they, cause there was never every, any evidence. There wasn't any evidence that proved that she had smothered them. That was the theory. They said they believed she had smothered them, but the autopsies didn't prove that or support that. So, you know, she sits in, in, in prison. No one believes her. She always said she was innocent. No one believed her, but now she finds out that she has a gene that likely did kill them. I feel just as horrible as a mother. I would feel just as horrible. Like there is no relief from the sadness and the misery of this. Yeah. And imagine thinking to yourself that everyone else believes you're a monster, that everyone says, OK, first is considered SIDS, second, the third and fourth. And then to have your husband not believe you at all, reading the journal, bringing it into the courtroom and saying he was fearful that he believes that she did this to the kids and when I heard about her upbringing, it's all the more tragic as well in the foster system at two because of what her dad did to her mom. Yeah. So her father stabbed her mother to death. She was she was a toddler at the time. She's taken in by family. Then eventually she's turned over as a ward of the state, eventually into an adopted family. And then... At age 20, she marries her husband and she begins her own family. The next set of tragedies. This is like a Shakespearean tragedy. It's horrible no matter how you look at it. So let's get into some of the facts here. Um, when the babies died, what it was believed that they died of, and, and, and look at it that way. So we're talking here about Kathleen Flobig. She is now 55 years old. She is free. She has been pardoned, but not exonerated, which is very important here as well. I'm sure important to her, to her family, because there are some who still believe that she's not innocent, including the father of the babies, mm -hmm. including the father of the babies. So his name is Craig Folbig, 
And again, he says he believes that she had a hand in killing them. Kathleen gave birth to four babies over a period of 10 years from 1989 to 1999. She had, as you said, two daughters, two sons, all died. And after the fourth one died, Susan, that's when doctors and police started investigating because they did move around. They moved a few times. As you can understand, you kind of want to start fresh. You're like, you know, I need a new environment. We're going to try and rebuild the family. I get that. You know, I don't get the sense that they were running away like from a crime. But if you're accused of a crime, couldn't you also see that as being potentially incriminating? I can see that. Absolutely. And the husband, I wonder when he may have grown suspicious and we always look at it uh, a crime and say, well, why didn't this happen? This could have happened. I wondered if maybe looking back at this, that he could have gotten her, not blaming him, but if someone could have stepped in, maybe your best friend and said, we want to get you the help that you need, maybe hoping that it wouldn't happen again. But again, science is showing that it was not preventable, that it had nothing to do with her, but it's not swaying the husband, of course. And we always want to know, Anna, as you know, the answer to why. Why would right. someone do this? If you were on the jury, you believe that. Why? I wonder if they pieced in her childhood and thought, well, this is why. Because right. of what the dad did to the mom. Again, she was just two years old, but hearing stories of that. So we never really understand what the motivation is in whatever crime we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. But again, she is uh, pardoned, but not exonerated at this point. And at the time of her conviction, her trial and conviction in 2003, Will Will was reminding us that the Human Genome Project was in its infancy. So again, the technology was just beginning, but not available to do this kind of genetic testing um, and to certainly identify this. So In 2003, she's convicted of murder and manslaughter in the deaths of her four children, and prosecutors again insisted that she had smothered the babies, though there was no forensic proof of this. Mm -hmm. So Kathleen has now been released. It's been 20 years. She didn't serve her full sentence. Here is Michael Davey, the attorney general, talking about this case and all of the loss. We've got four little bubbers who are dead. We've got a husband and wife who lost each other, uh, a woman who spent 20 years in jail, and a family that never had a chance. So you'd, you'd not be human if you didn't feel something about that, wouldn't you? It's hard not to feel like him and have compassion because it's true. It, it, this new information shines a light on this tragedy in such a different way. Yeah, the cards were stacked against her in so many ways. And of course, uh, the jury and the diaries and how significant that was. Her diary writing about her deepest, darkest thoughts. It was admissible. I believe that's what swayed the jury um, to rule, to believe uh, the prosecution in terms of what happened to her babies. I did see in a video when she was out of prison and and with her best friend and excited to use a spoon or have tea and they wanted that time together i'm curious to how the husband feels now or if if he swayed at all and also earlier in my career i remembered covering a sid's death it was so heartbreaking for the families uh the family that i met the husband and wife and they lost their son and it was really just unexplainable just as it's known that Um, definition of that, it's sudden infant death syndrome. So would this um, scientific knowledge that we have now lead to some answers there if other kids are predisposed to it, I wonder? I don't think I could ever sleep if I, if I'd lost a baby. I mean, I, even when I had my baby, I know you have your babies and I just, you know, you're constantly on alert. If you, you know, you're inching in, to, to hear them breathing, to, to, to see if there's a little bit of breath coming out of the nose. I mean, any little thing, you're just like staring at them because they're so small, small and they're so vulnerable. Worried about what's the right thing to do, sleeping on the stomach, sleeping on the right. back. My daughter is now 13. When she was born, this wasn't available with my son, who's seven it is, and I bought it. It, it goes on top of the mattress and you hear if there's any stoppage in breathing or any irregularities. It would be and something around his ankle. I remember that because of the story I had covered, because, uh, of course, having newborn, you're so fearful. So to have this happen over and over and over again, um, it's just truly heartbreaking. And I wonder what her next 
move is now that she's pardoned or what the next step is. I don't know. I, I don't even know, again, how you process this information. If, if she truly didn't kill the babies, mm -hmm. um, as she says, and now she finds out that she carries something that could have led to their deaths. I don't know how you process that as a human, as a parent. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But at least she'll have access to very good mental health and support outside of the prison system. It's, it's so key that you bring that up, especially for new moms. And back when my mom first had my sister and I, it just wasn't discussed postpartum depression. I mean, no. barely discussed when I had my daughter or they would call it baby blues. And there's postpartum psychosis that Brooke Shields wrote a book on or postpartum depression that she had, but there's different levels. And we've covered stories where you see it. And I wonder if it, we are talking about it enough because of what she wrote in the diaries to herself, if she had seen a psychiatrist, of course, that wouldn't be admissible. Uh, I don't believe it would have been. But it's just if there are moms out there, maybe she needed help that wasn't accessible or wasn't really um, what they were talking about 20 years ago. And then when you have this much loss, mm -hmm. it's always hard for anyone to know what to say or do. What words, words fail us in a situation like this? The loss of four babies I, it is a tragedy beyond anything I can comprehend. I, I can't. So let's look at the timeline. And so you all can see what was going on at the time and what the jury was presented with, with the limited information. So first baby born is Caleb. He died in his sleep in 1989 because of a breathing complication that he was apparently born with. He was 19 days old and doctors called it in Australia, they call it cot death or SIDS as we call it here. Okay. That is horrific. 19 days old, we under, you know, that is bad enough. Mm -hmm. So then Patrick is born in 1990. And at the age of three months, he suffers a seizure in his crib at night and he stopped breathing. The incident left him blind and with epilepsy. He continued to have seizures. And four months later, after another seizure, this one would claim his life. He was eight months old. The death was recorded as asphyxia due to airway obstruction and epileptic fits. So those are the first two babies. All right. So then after these tragedies, Kathleen and her husband move and they try again. So now it's 1992. Sarah is born. This is the couple's third child. Kathleen says that she's having trouble bonding with this baby. Mm -hmm. Understandable. You're afraid. You're so afraid. And so she's scared that something will happen to this baby. 10 months later, baby is dead. According to the autopsy report, Sarah too died of SIDS. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. All right. Now the marriage is falling apart. They are under a great deal of stress. They are hugely depressed, as one can understand. They are negotiating whether they're even going to try again. I don't even know that I would try again. Now they've lost three babies, mm -hmm. three babies. So they give it a few years. And in 1997, Laura is born. She is now the fourth child. She lives the longest, 18 months. Her mother said, this is what she said, that she found her blue in her crib while her husband was at work. She calls 911 hysterical. The cause of death was listed this time as undetermined. And that is what made it possible to move forward with the criminal investigation. Now authorities are very suspicious because who has four babies die like that if they can't find a medical reason, which is the part, the component that was missing at the time of the crime. So on April 19th, of 2001, Kathleen is arrested and charged with four counts of murder for the deaths of her children. And as you said, her husband was cooperating with authorities. He took the diaries to the police and he even testified against her. And so he cooperated. Therefore, I presume, Susan, that he was never under suspicion. Right. And her fourth daughter, as you said, being the oldest, I think that is what raised red flags, meaning she was too old um, to for it be for it to be called SIDS at that point, meaning the cutoff age here, and how could this possibly happen to so many of her kids? As you said, four kids, and I believe that the husband she didn't know it at the time had read through her diary, her journals, 
And that is what did it for him, meaning how could this happen so many times? I'm handing this over as evidence. And I don't think if they did not have the diaries, if she never wrote anything in there, that there would have been a conviction, because as you said, the deaths, what they were called and what they were considered. Um, so I think if she didn't write her darkest thoughts, not admitting to anything, but saying yeah. this is how I feel, um, that the jury would have decided, uh, because as you know, you said reasonable doubt, but it's all circumstantial at that point, And the diary may have put them over the edge. And what other explanation could there be? I think, you know, as they said, they kept saying over and over again, what are the statistical chances, the probability that four babies would just die on their own without intervention, you know, of a human hand to kill them? It's lot, statistically, it's, it's unheard of. And, and I was listening to a scientist who said there was another family who had lost four children. And that is when she started to look into this, this case. And uh, again, the testing was available at that time and said, well, this is interesting. And finally, her best friend was able to say, look, we have some hope here. You may get out because of this. And uh, newly out of prison and just wanting her privacy at this time. But I wonder if she will sue in any sort of way, if she's able to or not for the time that she was away, considering um, the scientific evidence. Yeah, I, I don't know whether the Australian legal system will require for her to be officially exonerated or proven innocent. Mm -hmm. What this did was it brought in a reasonable doubt that there could be another very reasonable answer as to why the babies all died as opposed to being killed. So I don't know if that, if she has to reach that threshold before she goes to the next level. I would think I would want to be exonerated. Pardoned is step one for me if I didn't do it. Right. Step two is I want, a, I want proof of innocence and I want the world to know that because people have called me a baby killer. In fact, when she was in prison, uh, the, she had to be isolated because the other women tried to kill her. They tried because they, they, you know, this was a woman who they believed had killed four babies. So it was a very difficult time for her, especially now if you believe that she's innocent. How horrific was this? No one could possibly believe her. And, and I'm sure if you turn the tables on her, she'd say, yeah, it would be hard for people to believe. Yeah. So two years later, after she's arrested, she's arrested in 2001, 2003, she goes on trial and prosecutors argued that Kathleen had smothered her children in fits of frustration. So they're using the diary, Susan, and her feelings of exhaustion, depression, all of these things to show that she was angry at the babies and wanted to kill them. And the prosecution's case was hinged on the theory that statistically it was improbable for four babies to just die. It just doesn't happen. So there had to be another reason. So there wasn't a lot of evidence and she appeared to be sinister. Uh, the, the headlines were all against her. The public was against her. The diary entries um, in, in one, um, she talked about, you know, her, how upset she was in her rage and her depression. She wrote in one entry, quote, obviously I'm my father's daughter. Okay, we now know that the father killed the mother. What's the implication there? Right. Wow. For, I didn't know that for the jury to hear that. And I know that she wrote this when people write in a journal or a diary. You don't think it's going to be read by anyone, much less a jury deciding your fate. Yeah. Just... It's and just incredible. Friend, um, I believe her name's Tracy, said that when she read the diary, she was heartbroken for the pain she was going through at the time. So it it would matter the context that it's in, right? Four babies dying. If you're a member of the jury, you're assessing, okay, it's circumstantial, but this may point to that. Yes. And of course, the scientific evidence wasn't there. So what else, statistically speaking, um, maybe you put on an expert, the defense, to say that, yes, this could happen, although rare this could, um, to refute that, and possibly a psychologist who did speak out. But um, did, no one was believing her, right? And, no one believed her. No one could believe there was any other explanation to how those babies died. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds horrible, almost like a mob mentality, but again, it's just it's so unusual for, for four babies to just die, and most people would probably stop. Or yeah. I, 
Exactly. And it I, makes sense now that you mentioned uh, what she wrote there about her father, because I wondered how that was admissible in this case. But if you write about it and you talk about it, that's admissible. Therefore, her childhood could be discussed. And what kind of trauma did she go through? And did this cause her to do this? Right, right, right. So Kathleen is then sentenced. She's found guilty and sentenced to 40 years in prison, which is later reduced to 30. She was one of the most hated women in Australia, certainly hated by all the other inmates. Uh, Kathleen said that she was innocent the whole time, and they tried all these appeals, and they exhausted all appeals. Everything was denied. Then in 2018, a professor at Australian National University was curious about Kathleen's DNA, and she wanted to do some DNA testing. So she went to Kathleen and, and got DNA swabs and started testing and they, she started with Kathleen, trying to figure out, could there have been any other, because it's, it's such a notorious case, mm-hmm. could there be any other explanation? And the researcher found something called the CALM, C-A-L-M, the CALM2 gene, which is a mutation, which apparently didn't cause Kathleen medical problems, because that was the next thing. Just because they found this gene, it was not a slam dunk. This thing took years because they're like, okay, well, she may have the gene, but how come she's alive? She didn't die if this if this is such a dangerous gene. So, and it is believed, it is possible, the medical journals believe it is one of the possible causes of SIDS. So this gene is responsible for the distribution of calcium ions through tissues. That's, that's kind of what it does. And in, in an infant, it can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. Mm. So the condition is extremely rare. On top of everything else, it's extremely rare, reportedly occurring one in every 35 million people. Like, what are the chances? I wonder that- if you the husband, right? Because what are the chances that you have that gene and right, you're not sick as you mentioned, but you're passing it along allegedly to the kids. Yeah, so researchers then tested the DNA of the four babies. Mm -hmm. And then scientists found that Kathleen's daughters, both of them had the calm to mutation and both of Kathleen's sons were were carriers of something called the BSN gene mutation, which has been linked to a lethal form of epilepsy. Could a woman possibly be more unlucky than this Kathleen? Unbelievable. And considering her childhood, what happened to her when she was two, the father killing the mother, then this, she's away for years and years, 20 years, and finding out that finally, finally, science may prove that everybody was wrong. Knowing that you're innocent, if she is, if she's in prison saying, I didn't do this, what can she do? Really nothing because it's circumstantial and no one believed her except her one friend. Yes. And this team of scientists, this one scientist that then got more scientists on board. It's interesting. Kathleen's attorneys asked the father, Craig, to submit a DNA sample and he refused. He refused. And I guess he can't be compelled. I don't know what that means. It's interesting, isn't it? It is interesting, isn't it? It is interesting. So there were several hearings on this, inquiries. I don't know what they call it in Australia. Again, this was not a slam dunk. The first few um, reviews of of the data and all the testimony brought forth by the scientists, they were rejected. And so it was a a constant um, gathering of support and the scientific community and having more scientists on board. It got to the point where there was something like a petition with um, a scientist from all over the world signing on and saying on to the research, yes, indeed, this is possible. This is indeed possible based on the genetic testing. Two Lobe, uh, Nobel laureates also weighed in on this. So it, it grew. It took, like I said, it took several years of the scientific and and, um, legal system to come to terms with what this evidence provided them. So the results of the final inquiry, plus that petition signed by the world's leading authorities in this area, really pushed the attorney general and the governor to finally pardon. So on June 5th, on June 5th of this year, 2023, Kathleen was released from prison after the evidence suggested that her children most likely did die of causes related to their genetic history. 
Here is a video statement that Elizabeth made. Uh, this is from Seven News Australia. This is after she was released. Hello, uh, this is Kathleen. I'm extremely humbled and extremely grateful for being pardoned and released from prison. My eternal gratitude goes to my friends and family, especially Tracy and all of her family, and I would not have survived this whole ordeal without them. Today is a victory for science and especially truth. And for the last 20 years I have been in prison, I have forever and will always think of my children, grieve for my children, and have missed them and love them terribly. Thank you. What an amazing case this is. I bet she lost all hope as any person would, especially after the appeals process has been exhausted and then finally scientifically. But as you said, Anna, it wasn't overnight. It wasn't one test. Okay, we now know. And I wonder if that played into her husband saying, look, I'm not letting you test me. Because as you know, so many trials that we've covered, Anna, it's the battle of the experts. You have someone on the stand who says this, someone on the stand who says that. And then they almost cancel each other out. So maybe he was thinking, I'm not going to allow a scientist to analyze um, me and to kind of play that into their narrative. But it is science. And as you mentioned, the top in the field with really nothing to gain here for, mm -hmm. for saying this could have led to their deaths, uh, what they were um the genetic makeup of the children. So that was enough for her. And I wonder if there are people now because of this who finally believe what she's been saying the whole time, that she had nothing to do with this. What an unfortunate woman, honestly. Just what a horrible hand she was dealt in life. Tragedy from the beginning. I, I just, I can't. I'm curious about what you all are going to think about this when we talk about what is justice, has justice been served, and what do you believe? What do you believe about this case? Our next case is equally as troubling. It is out of Norwalk, Ohio, where police say a two-year-old boy accidentally shot his pregnant mother in the back while he was playing with a loaded gun. Police have declared this a tragic accident. I can't even wrap my head around this one. And she was able to call 911 after she was shot in the back and say exactly what had happened, that her two-year-old got through the gates that are normally there. And, and the gun was on her bedside table and it was loaded. And she was able to talk at the time. She was having difficulty breathing. And I'm sure at two years old, you don't know what's going on. No. I had heard that he was crying in the background, of course. It's just so heartbreaking, of course. And they, um, she went into an emergency C-section pregnant at the time. They weren't able to save the baby. Just so excruciating all around. Oh my God, if the first case was tragic, so is this one. I just, oh, it is so sad. So now you have two people dead, a mother and her unborn child. We're talking about 31-year-old Laura Ilg and her 33-week-old unborn baby. And she was carrying a little boy, both killed. Police say it was her two-year-old son, Liam, who either pulled the trigger. This is the part that's unclear. They're still doing testing here. Did this, because I, I actually, I turned to um, a friend of mine and I said, do you really think a two-year-old can pull a trigger? You know, because depending on the gun and their hands are so tiny and it's heavy. And so what they are testing now is, was the trigger pulled, uh, police say that the gun was loaded, or did the gun discharge accidentally while the little boy was playing with it? Or could it have like, you know, fallen and hit, you know, a number of things could have happened ballistically. And it's still under investigation, as you said, because that was my initial thought about the heaviness of the gun. And even if you are skilled, if you know much about guns or you're able to shoot it yourself, it seems difficult for an adult. So for a two year old, obviously no intent at two. Maybe he just walked in and dropped it yeah. and she was shot in the back. I know she was doing laundry and was able to have the, the wherewithal to call 911 and explain what happened, because what if she wasn't able to do that? Would our minds have gone to the husband? I know he was at work and he was able to come. I mean, it's just so sad all around. And they tried, of course, to save her, the mom and the baby, too. Oh, I don't. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's so it's so disturbing. I do 
uh, you know, police have said very clearly that the mother in real time before she passed, because she passed at the hospital, she was able not only over the phone to 911, but also when paramedics and EMTs arrived and police, she was able to tell them in real time what had happened. She was the witness that could recount it for them because the house was locked when they arrived. So this happened on June 16th. Laura was home with her son. Her husband was at work. Laura's doing laundry. Her son apparently doesn't usually have access to the couple's room there. As you said, Susan, there were a number of safety gates in the house. And generally the child is not allowed upstairs where the bedroom is. And it's believed that the gun was loaded in the nightstand or on the nightstand and that Laura didn't realize while she's busy doing laundry that the boy had climbed up and was in there, gotten the gun and was playing with it. So what's amazing is that Laura was shot in the back. When I heard that the mother was shot in the back, I'm like, hold on a minute. Yeah. That sounds diff- that sounds like someone broke into the house and shot her. Right. But, you know, once police finished their forensics on this and the angle of things, yeah, it was hard to believe, right? Yeah. And I believe she called her husband too and screamed something about um, the two-year-old and uh, apparently through the investigation, in hindsight, we don't want this family to suffer anymore, right. but you can't help but think, why wasn't it locked up or why was it loaded or why wasn't there kind of a safety latch? I don't know much about what could have been on that gun. I know there's different laws in place under Gabby Giffords, Giffords law, but Ohio, I just believe that they make sure you have like a the safety that that's Mm -hmm. when you buy a gun that's on there but uh of course the intention wasn't there but when you think of that innocent child and what he will have to go through for the rest of his life seeing it maybe thinking oh it's a toy they don't know they don't know and it just takes that one time and for you to be doing laundry or just doing something for one minute is just so excruciating for of course the family the extended family and the husband Oh, it's so, so tragic. So Laura calls 911 at 1.11 p.m. And she tells dispatchers she's been shot in the back by her two-year-old son. So she identifies that immediately. Moments later, authorities then receive a 911 call from her husband, Alec. He's 28 years old. And he says, my wife called me screaming and hysterical that she needs help. Here's a clip of the 911 call of the husband calling the authorities asking them to please rush over to his home. No, she called me in hysterics. I couldn't get any more information from her other than something about my son and calling 911. Officers arrive on the scene three minutes later. This is unbelievable how quickly they got there. So it's now 1.14 and they couldn't get into the house because it was locked. Now I find this interesting. So Laura is on the phone with the 911 operator And the 911 operator is like, police are there, police are there, they're at your front door, it's locked. And she, and Laura says, it is locked. I keep the door locked. Tell them to break in. They kick in the door. They find Laura in the bedroom. They find the baby screaming, obviously. I mean, it's it's a horrible situation. Laura is, is still conscious, able to explain to the police what has happened. She asked them to please remove the baby from the room so he doesn't have to be further traumatized by what he is experiencing and seeing. Oh, I just, I can't, I can't even. Seeing I can't his even. mom shot, so he clearly, he had a concept, I would assume, because he's crying, that something was wrong with his mom. And it's just even more heartbreaking that she was able to call the police, say, break in, going under this, knowing it was serious, of course, and calling her husband and everyone's there and uh, just hoping that she would survive this. Because I think her unborn son was at 33 weeks, so they tried to save him too. Oh, so they rush her to the hospital. They do an emergency C-section. They can't save the baby. And then Laura dies. It's just like the worst tragedy, worst day ever for this family. Mother, unborn baby, little two-year-old playing with the gun. Somehow his actions that he didn't know led to the death of his mom and his unborn sibling. Oh, it's just awful. And we always hear stories like this um, of guns not being locked, easily accessible. Of course, you don't want to blame this family. It's the most accident it really is. And you, I 
bet that husband, I hope that he's okay, wondering what he could have done differently, what he should have done differently, um, what could have happened. And, you know, it's just the way it is that there's certain families who do have firearms in the house. And I believe this family had even more. Um, yes. And what's in what's interesting, Susan, is that the police uh, made a comment about how so many of the cabinets had safety latches on them and that there were all these little gates, child safety gates all over the house. So this is a family, again, because, you know, this is such a terrible tragedy. This is, these are parents who had, you know, um, who were so conscientious to, to provide all these other latches and safety gates but when it came to the gun, I guess they didn't think that the child could get to that location. That is where their attention to detail appears to have lapsed. And even when you mentioned the front door being locked and her saying, of course, I locked my door. I know you do. I do. I mean, that's commonplace. But the real danger was inside. It was the loaded gun that yeah. no one intentionally would put there. The two year old has no idea what he's holding. Um, and that's the tragedy. You're right. The gates. So there's a lot of safety measures in place in this house. Uh, but no one would have thought that a two year old, it just takes seconds, as you know, to do anything harmful. Again, not blaming anyone, but being able to hold the gun and now shoot his mom and the unborn little boy that they tried to save. It truly is horrific. Oh, it's the worst. Authorities say that they recovered one spent shell casing along with the weapon at nine millimeters. So that's what the gun that he was allegedly playing with. They also found um, that there were an additional 12 rounds available. So the belief is that the gun was fully loaded. And as they searched the house, they went back with a search warrant. Um, they found other weapons. They recovered an additional 12 round magazine, as I just said, for the nine millimeter. Plus in the bedroom, police say that they found a 12 gauge shotgun with six rounds in there. And then they found a rifle in the computer room. So according to Laura's husband, Alec, he said the guns were all his, the, these were his weapons. Police are now investigating the functionality of the weapon that went off hoping to discover what happened, whether the toddler could have possibly have pulled the trigger or there was something wrong with the gun. Um, I, I just, there's just, there's just no way of knowing. And I wonder why it was on their bedside table. Had something happened prior to this? Were they afraid of something specific? Is that Maybe. normally where they kept it or was it in a drawer? Or would it have been more difficult for him to find, even though of course it was loaded, but on the bedside table? Is, I don't uh, know, wonder. because the search warrant says, according to the Norwalk Police Department, they say that there were even child locks, not just on the cabinets, but on accessible drawers. I Again, too, right. You put everything in place, what you're taught, especially about toddlers, because that's all you're doing is making sure this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. And they go for the socket or they go for things that could hurt them, even if you have a million toys around and they, they go for what is dangerous. So that you spend so much time, especially in that age range of trying to keep them safe. And then I really feel for this husband. I, I hope there's not a lot of self blame for that, because what he did end up hurting the mother with was something that they had there to keep them safe. I'm imagining it. it is that why yeah. it was on the bedside table? I heard an interview with one of the neighbors who just said, um, you know, he knew the husband. It was just heartbreaking for him. You see a pregnant a mom expecting her second boy. And then this tragedy. Oh, Yes. Oh, it's just awful. So no charges have been filed here. Uh, the police report will be sent on to the prosecutor's office and they will make decisions about whether there could possibly be any charges filed here. The Norwalk police chief, David Smith, has said, absolutely, this has been investigated as an accident. And then he reminded the public and said, please, you know, safely store your firearms. Think of trigger locks, gun saves. Um, he said there are a million of million varieties of, of um, safety things that you can do that aren't expensive, that won't cost you a lot of money. And he said at the very least, please don't leave a gun um, that's loaded if, if you've got children in the house. So that was coming from the police chief. 
It's uh, the surviving two year old, of course, is with his dad. Um, there's been a tribute to to the late wife that the husband wrote on Facebook. He mm. wrote, quote, if you haven't heard Laura and our unborn son, Talzin, passed away on Friday. There are no words for the pain and loss I feel. She was, is, and will always be the love of my life. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. Here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. How's it going? Good. Great to see you, Susan. Uh, So this week we have a case of a bad dream leading to a man's arrest after this guy accidentally shot himself while dreaming that his house was getting burgled. So this case comes out of Lake Barrington, Illinois, where a 62-year-old man reportedly accidentally shot himself in his sleep while dreaming about a burglary attempt. And he's now, here's the kicker, been charged with illegally owning a firearm. So just still piling on top of this guy, the the worst luck ever. Uh, But according to the Lake County Sheriff's Office, uh, deputies responded to a home after receiving a call about a person shot where they found our suspect here, Mark DeCara, suffering from a gunshot wound to his leg. And apparently he was losing a lot of blood. So the deputies act quickly. They apply a tourniquet. And while they're trying to figure out what's going on here, he reportedly tells investigators that he had a dream someone was breaking into his home. So he picked up, I mean, normal reaction as we all do, uh, he picked up his 357 Magnum and fired at what he thought was the burglar. But instead of hitting the dream burglar, he shoots himself, apparently immediately wakes up from the dream. Uh, So he was transported to a local hospital for treatment of the wound. And the, the bullet here, it ends up lodging itself in the suspect's bedding, which was really fortunate because uh, Mark DeCara here had a, a wall that he shared with neighbors. So oh, luckily dear. nobody was injured there. Um, but th- the kicker for this guy is that the Lake County investigators learned that DeCara's firearm owner's identification card had been revoked, but he still owned this gun. So he was arrested um, at, you know, after he was cleared medically uh, and he, they approved the, on charges of possession of a firearm without a valid FOID card and reckless discharge of a firearm. He was booked in the Lake County Jail, but later released after posting bond. Um, so this is a wild one. Uh, we, we got a lot of comments on this. Anita S. Uh, had talked about this guy's luck. Uh, they said, dang, first you shoot yourself, then you get arrested. That's some luck. Um, what a way. Like, I this has got to be up there with the most embarrassing ways yeah. to to self incriminate yourself. I mean, it, it's one thing to you know to, to talk a little too much or something, but to end up shooting yourself and then getting charged um, that that's a rough day. <laughs> that's how a rough day. Deep I, sleep, right? I mean, how deep of a sleep are you in where it's you you're shooting and then you're your worst enemy in terms of charges? You really yeah. blame there. Well, and I I wonder what the sleeping situation is, because like in my mind, the way I'm drawing it up, uh, this suspect looks like Ebenezer Scrooge does in like, uh, you know, Christmas carol things. He's like kind of scraggly looking. I'm imagining a nightgown, uh, like a a sleeping gown to the ground uh, and like a a, a revolver underneath the pillow. I don't know if that's his situation. Um, I'll show the the mugshot here for our listeners. He actually kind of looks like Daryl Hammond when he's doing his uh, like Bill Clinton on SNL. (laughs) <laughs> um, kind of a similar look. We got a lot of comments on this mugshot that people were like, is that Bill Clinton? Um, oh it is not. It is not. Uh, Raya Otto uh, said maybe it was less embarrassing for him to make up this story instead of admitting he forgot to clear the chamber before cleaning it. So they're not really believing this whole sleep narrative. I'd rather um, say I didn't clean the chamber than I shot myself in a dream, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that there's way less embarrassing ways to 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 tell a story about shooting yourself than you were than a dream burglar. Uh, I don't know about that one. Uh, um, Enochian was not having it with the story. They said paranoid people can't relate. I'm too busy enjoying my life. Yeah, way to go. Um, I am also not sleeping with a uh, sleeping with a gun. And if I did, I, I would probably take Ambien or something to make sure that I'm not I'm, I'm, you know, nothing is happening in my sleep. I heard you can walk or sleepwalk on Ambien. Imagine I've heard of stories, people cooking. I don't know. Yeah, I, I maybe that's the wrong move. Then yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. But you got <laughs> to prevent the sleepwalking. You got to prevent the sleepwalking if you sleep with a gun, I feel like. Oh, my gosh. Craziness. Uh, yeah, well, I got to give a, he- a shout out to the the team over at the TCD website. Um, they put burgled in the title of this. So we got a comment from Max that said, I was today years old when I learned the word burgled was real. I always hear burglarized in its place. 
I also had to look this up. Um, it's a it's a great word. I'm, I don't know how often I can you know insert it into my vocabulary, but I think that the hamburglar burgled qualifies as a oh, sentence. Oh, so yes, the hamburglar. Yes. Yeah. So so that that was life changing for me. Uh, but my favorite comment was from CJX. They said, "Dude was out gunning for Mr. Sandman." Um, Ooh, which, that's a good one. I think I, I think sand, like you were afraid of the Sandman, uh, and that's who you thought you were shooting is is maybe better than dreaming of a burglary. But I don't know. That's just me. That's my two cents. That's gonna do it for this week's comment section. Thank you so much to everyone who sent those in. You can leave those over on our YouTube community page. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Until next week, that'll do it. Thanks, Will. Bye, Will. Bye. So, Susan, before we go, I, I just want to talk a little bit about you're writing a book about the Delphi murders. Does this mean that the book, you can't really finish the book until the case is closed? Well, I I am finished. It, it comes out on September 19th because I did want, of course, I started writing it before anyone was in custody. And what stood out to me the most, the reason I wanted to write it is you and I have discussed this before, just the effect that the families had on me, how as a journalist, this story sat different, maybe because of the amount of time. You really do, as a reporter, develop a bond with some of the people you meet under the worst of circumstances. And, you know, there are some families that I'm still close with. And one mom in particular, um, who I'm still close with, her son was murdered. And it's, it's a different bond that and it's a level of trust. And um, also, I think for me personally, and I think it's true of you that, you know, we go in there, it's our job to cover these cases, but you can't leave your humanity at the door, right? You have to be still a human being and present in the moment. And you must be the human first, mm -hmm. the reporter second. Yeah. And um, I don't want to be there. And I heard this, as you just said, um, it's a club no one wants to be a member of, but once they are, they understand it beyond what we can even comprehend in, in terms of what they're suffering from. So, right, I think it's, they appreciated the reporting from all the journalists that covered this story because they wanted to get the word out. They wanted this guy caught. They wanted it to not do this to another family. Um, but then sometimes it could cross the line given all the information we were given and then the information that was kept out. Um, so we'll see, but the it certainly wasn't for lack of trying with law enforcement, considering everyone they brought in. Where can people follow you on social media, Susan? It's um, I have an Instagram account at Susan Hendricks. Same with Twitter, and uh, the book comes out September nineteenth. Down the hill, my descent into the double murder in Delphi. Wow. Well, uh, we'll have you back when the book is out. May have you back before that if there's a big break in this case. Uh, you can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. You can find this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, get our newsletter by going to truecrimedaily.com. Uh, until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs> <laughs>